Hello and welcome to another episode of How to Be a Great Player. In today's episode, we are going to be looking at six ways that you can flesh out your character. And that is ways in which you can make your character just that much more unique and more real to your fellow players. And how do we do that? Well, first up on the list is physical description. Now, a lot of us look at things like height and weight and hair color and eye color and go, well, what's the point? Who cares? You can't see the figure. It's an imagination in, well, it's a figure of imagination inside my head. Well, yes and no. If you don't play to it, if you don't role play to it, well, then sure, it's just going to be another wasted stat, which very seldom comes into play. When was the last time that your game master said to you, um, are you six foot one inch? No? Well, then the suit of armor doesn't fit you. Are you a size 11 shoe? No? Well, then these gravity boots can't be used by you. That was a very long time ago where we got that specific in role playing. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending, it has also allowed us as players to step back and not be so specific. When last did you fill in perhaps hair color and then do anything about it? Just because you put blonde there, did you ever use it later on in the game? Well, maybe not. Here's your opportunity to do so. So by adding physical descriptors to your character, you can start to work out how that would affect your character in everyday role playing. If your character is quite tall, perhaps they hunch down a little bit, or every time they walk in through a door, they duck. If your character is very short, perhaps you should lower your chair down, and then you can appear short so you can look up at all your fellow players. And you can try and reach for door handles and go, oh, I, I can't get there. Well, perhaps. All that it's doing is it's a very simple little way for you to bring life to your character, to make your character just stand out that much more. Perhaps your character has a rather crooked hand. So then maybe one of your hands is crooked when you're interacting with players and you try and have, oh no, I can't use that hand, I'll use that hand. By repeating the process time and time again throughout your playing sessions, the other players will pick up on it and they will be amazed at how much life you've brought to your character. Number two, mannerisms. Now mannerisms don't just have to be something as violent as an eye twitch because ultimately after four hours you might go home with an incurable twitch. No, no, no. Mannerisms could simply be something like every time your character draws his sword, he taps the hilt twice and then taps his forehead. Please let the sword protect my body. It could be whenever he is past a beer, he has to clink it with somebody else. When last did you go through the motions of having a celebratory toast? Some of you may have, some of you may never have. By adding in just one or two mannerisms, it doesn't have to be in a comprehensive list, you can bring things to life. Does your character trace the tattoos on the back of their hand when they're nervous? So when the GM is explaining something to you, you sit there doing this all the time. The other players will pick up on it and say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm tracing out the tattoo that's on the back of my hand because I'm nervous. It just brings that character to life in their imagination as well as your own. So mannerisms can be very powerful. If you really like playing with your mouth and your accent, well, maybe they speak out of the side of their mouth. There are certainly very few who can do it properly, and there's one who's made his entire career out of speaking out of the side of his mouth. So maybe that's the mannerism. If you want to do an accent, that's fine, but then try and keep it all the way through. So make sure that when you're doing accents, you can do it subconsciously, so that you don't drift in and out and in and out. But yeah, there's only one way to try, and that's to practice, 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 and do it whilst you're playing a game. Something that a lot of people don't add in is world view. Now, world view is different from the character type, and we did a whole series of videos on what your character type might be. So a soul character or a defender character, a dependable character or a protector character gives you some broad strokes of what that person might be like. But world view is how do they view other people in the world? Are they optimistic? Are they pessimistic? Are they outgoing? Are they reserved? Are they open? Are they friendly? 
are they indifferent? Are they arrogant and haughty, in which case they look down their noses at any NPC that they come across whom they don't perceive as being of value? Trying to give your character a worldview to how they generally approach most situations will, again, just imbibe the character with a sense of three-dimensionality to it. Is your character, perhaps their origin, is that they were born a commoner on a dirtball planet in the middle of nowhere? But they are longing for adventure, so they see every opportunity, an opportunity to just go further and explore more. They don't have to be the adventurer type to do that. A dependable character can really, come on, let's, let's go, let's, but I, I won't go if, if you won't go. And that'll make me a little bit sad because I really want to go out there and explore and, and just experience all this amazing wonder. But perhaps they're jaded and they've flown from one side of the galaxy to the other and they've never seen anything like the Force. In which case, they might be an adventurer, but it's an adventurer for a bargain. It's not an adventurer for some airy, fairy concept. So they're a bit more practical when it comes to adventures. So worldview can have a really big impact on how your character interacts with the rest of the world and the rest of the party. Number four pain points. Now this is something that I have very seldom seen come up. When it does, it's absolutely fantastic role-playing gold. Pain points. What are the points that your character refuses to engage in? Does your character shut off religion and the moment they're approached by a priest or someone spouting out philosophical ideas, they turn and walk away? Does your character perhaps not have any truck whatsoever with the abuse of children? In which case, it doesn't matter whether they are a protector or a soul or a leader. If children are being hurt, they will step in or they'll step away. Maybe they don't want to have anything to do with it. By building in this idea of pain points, of areas that your character refuses to budge on, you're not creating an immovable character. You're not creating a character who's going to disrupt the flow. You're creating a character that may or may not bring a different perspective to the typical gaming environment. Now, here's a caveat. None of these things should get in the way of the story. Your job as the player is to figure out how to use these tools to create your character in the story. So don't ever say, well, my character is negative, so I'm not going to go on the quest because I'm just I'm negative. No. He needs to go on the quest and constantly be saying, we're all going to die down here. By doing that, he's helping to create story for the GM. He's helping to create atmosphere. And it gives you an opportunity for him to change over time. This is something that we never see in characters. We never see them starting off as X and ending up as Y. Yet, in feature films, that's the primary goal. The character should start off in one phase and end in another. They should have gone on a journey. We don't really see that in role-playing. Why not? Well, because do you even know what your character is when they start? Perhaps they're a pessimist. But over the course of 20 adventures, they've become an optimist. Or maybe they started an op as an optimist, and by the time they got to the end of the adventures, many, many sessions in, they've become more of a pessimist or more of a realist. Worldview can be a very powerful tool uh, for creating a setup, pain points, become a very good supporting tool onto that worldview and how to create a very distinct character. And then what we need to balance that off with is desires. Now, desires are not the same thing as needs and wants, and that's a whole different story altogether. Desires is the soul character who wants to build a library because they feel that if they surround themselves by books, they will be better for it. So desires are not the same as goals. Goals would be, I want to go to the dungeon, I want to rescue the princess, and I want to get back home again. A desire would be, I want to fulfill my soul's purpose, which is to write great poems. And in order to do that, I'll go on adventures that have goals. It's an intangible something. It's an, it's a, an aspiration to better things. So desires can be really powerful and they can really make your GM's day when you say, well, my character desires to be titled Lord. 
How's he going to do that? Well, he can do a whole bunch of things and he can go on a whole bunch of missions, but the GM can now use that to help create much better stories for you as he seeks to get your character into positions where he can become titled or where he can lose titles. And you as the player, well, now you're looking at quests from a slightly different perspective, aren't you? You might be a dependable type, in which case you will go with your companions regardless of what the adventure is, but if you can come out of it with a title or perhaps with a book for your that library that you're building, well, so much the better. Then finally, to really offset all of this, is fears and phobias. And there was a question asked on one of the channel, one of the videos, how do you create horror in a role-playing game? How do you create fear? It is very hard to create fear in a game where you are sitting around a table with a bunch of friends in a social environment. And yes, you're listening to the GM talk about the dark streets closing around you, etc., etc., etc. But you've really got nothing to fear. There's no ways the GM's creatures are going to come out and haunt you. You might have a very vivid imagination, which is good, but you're still surrounded by people who are drinking Coca-Cola and eating chips and rolling dice. The way you create fear is by giving your character something to be fearful about. If your character has a fear of birds, well, that could be quite useful. And it could drive a whole bunch of mannerisms. If your character has a fear of short people, well, that makes him all the more interesting when you come across a colony of dwarves. Throwing in a couple of fears, throwing in a couple of phobias, we're not talking create massive lists here. We're simply saying give your character things that they're fearful about. And over time, add it to the list. Yes, your character is becoming stronger and more powerful as they level up or as they advance or as they skip, spend skill points or whatever you want to call it. But if you get beaten up by a bunch of thugs on a regular basis, you might become a little bit fearful about walking into warehouses late at night on your own. That should inspire you as a player to say, hey, come on, come, I, I'm not going in there on my own. No, 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 I, I can't. I can't go in there on my own. Come with me. So you can include people to help you overcome your fear. Again, players around you will simply marvel at the fact that you're trying to include everyone. Meanwhile, you're just trying to express your fear. And if you're pretending to be fearful, that helps the GM make a much darker and more fearful environment. The fears can also be used for comedic relief. If you're afraid of horses and yet you have to ride a horse, every time the horse, say, stumbles, your character screams out aloud. That might become a bit much after a while, but it also gives your character the opportunity when they're saved by their horse to start to develop a liking for horses. And again, we now see character changing over time, not radically, but and not, and certainly, well, certainly not radically and certainly not quickly, but the character starts to change over time and gets to feel real. So those are the six things that I would use to flesh out my character. You've got great backstory now. You've got a great idea of the type of character that you're going to be playing. And of course, now you've got your six points to flesh out your character. All you need now is to be able to actually play in a game. And hopefully we'll be looking at that in coming episodes which is how to get the most out of what is available to you. Until next time, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button preferably, and remember always to have fun and happy playing.